Well, um, I would like to give some credit for some of these ideas, so I will. Um, I came across an amazing book a few years ago. It's called How People Learn. It's available from the National Research Council. If you, email, if you Google National Research Council, you will find they have a whole bunch of books. But there's How People Learn Things. Wow, it's just amazing. It is research. It's not, this isn't about classroom teachers. This is about the university people who, who think about what goes on when people learn things. The sequel to it is called How Students Learn. And the, um, the emphasis here is on classroom. So a third of the book is about how students learn mathematics, a third of it is about how students learn science, a third is how students learn history. All of it is rather fascinating. It has lots of little classroom vignettes and things, mistakes children make and what you can do to fix it. It is an amazing book. Um, and, but it's, it, again, it, it's from way up there. It's from the people who spend their time doing research. Um, and so, there are three principles in the chapter of mathematics that I would like us to reflect upon, and I suspect that without too much effort, these could be the three things. And the first one is teachers must engage students' preconceptions. In other words, you have to have some idea of where the kids are before you try to build on that. Learning is necessarily built on your experiences. What do you know? What do you do? I'm sorry, I don't care how good you are, you're not gonna teach me to play the violin. Not now. I have no skills to build on. I have no knowledge to build on. You're probably not going to teach me how to fix a car because I don't have experiences to build on. Uh, the most startling moment of this, I was teaching a geometry class and I wanted to get some idea of what they know. So I wrote, that on the overhead and walked around. I figured it was worth 30 seconds because I wanted to see if they knew. This was a B, this was an elementary class. We called it empirical geometry. These were kids who weren't ready for real geometry. The first kid I got to was doing this. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm drawing 211 lines. <laughs> I wish I was clever enough to make that up. <laughs> now, what struck me was, if I had just started the lesson, lesson talking about, the kid would have been waiting for the other nine. He didn't see 11 lines. There was a misconception about what I meant. Now, yes, maybe I should have written the word parallel. Maybe I, I know I said it, but some kids aren't very auditory. You have to write it and say it and draw it, and they have to as well. But that really happened. Here is, this is taken right from how children learn, but it's... It, that's a subtext. Text. It's taken from one of my favorite children's books, Fish is Fish. Any of you know that book? You will in a moment. Have to give them credit. Fish is Fish, Leo Leone. And this, the name, the, the idea is that this fish and this tadpole become friends. Good friends. And they hang around all the time together and they just have a great time. And then, of course, the tadpole grows up and leaves the water. 
And the fish is very sad. And then one day his friend comes back. And his friend tells him about this wonderful world out there outside the lake. For example, there are birds. Birds have wings and feathers. And that's what the fish is thinking. Because the fish knows fish. So when his friend tells him about what fish are like, that's what he's thinking about. And they tell him about cows. <laughs> and he tells him about people. Now, isn't that just a wonderful analogy for what's going on? You say square. Their experience with a square is the town square, the peanut butter square. You talk about the goal line. They think of a big white rectangle at the end of a football field. Because that's the perception that they're building on. And if we don't notice and address those, there are enormous miscommunications about what's happening. The second principle from the book is that understanding requires factual knowledge and conceptual framework. And conceptual framework. Um, isn't this what the math wars is all about? First, you have to have that factual knowledge before you can have the framework. Well, what the research shows is, is that one without the other is a recipe for failure. You have to be able to compute. You have to know the vocabulary and the notation. You have to have that stuff down, but at the same time, it has to be in a real conceptual framework that relates to what you know, to your experiences, so that you can connect it with someone. Seymour Papert at MIT uh, invented a computer language called Logo that was meant for small children and was meant to get them to think geometrically. I embraced it. I thought it was wonderful. It has since sort of become a minor thing as computers changed and it didn't, it didn't get the right marketing and whatever. But he did write a book about his life and one of the things he says is that as a very, very young child he learned about gears. And he thought gears were wonderful. And he claims every mathematical idea that he had to understand until he was working on his PhD at MIT, he could interpret in terms of gears. Not just ratios, the whole thing. He just put it back into this context about how gears work and how things work. I, he's on my list of the 10 people I would love to sit down and spend a couple days with because I would like to know how this really worked. But, but the point is that there's a framework for the knowledge and without that framework the knowledge isn't particularly useful. Now, we know that. It's what Zalman talks about when he says you have to do applications. Things have to be applications. But I would take it even a little, a little wider than that. Anyway, and then the third one Involves a word we don't often use, you know, a metacognitive approach enables students self-monitoring. What does that mean? It means that it's not enough to teach kids the Pythagorean theorem, and it's not enough to teach them that if they're trying to solve an equation that they should line the two equations up and do the subtraction and do this. It, it's not enough to teach them that they should find a common denominator and make it. It's they have to think about why they're doing what they're doing. 
Now, we do that. We may not even know that we do that, but we do that. It, it must be evident in a dozen things that I've done this morning already. When I just sort of said, oh, wait a minute, I've got a thought here. Right? I'm thinking about where this is going and how it's happening and how do I know this and why is this important and what's going on here. It's almost like, you know, metacognition ought to be on that list of the three or four things. The problem is you can't hardly ever tell when it's going on.